Welcome to this Introduction to Structured Illumination Microscopy presentation. I'm Nina Vyas and I'm a postdoc at the B24 Beamline at the Diamond Light Source. In this presentation, we'll be going through the principles behind how structured illumination microscopy works and how it can increase the resolution, its advantages and disadvantages over other super resolution techniques, and some examples of how it's been used for correlative imaging at Diamond. First, I'll start with a brief background about the diffraction limit. In microscopy, when light goes through an objective lens, it diffracts and interferes because it's going in different directions, and this causes interference patterns. So an infinitesimally small point appears in the microscope as a spot with a certain size. And it has these concentric rings around it, which are caused because of the light diffracting and interfering. And this diffraction pattern is called an airy disk. Plotting a line through this creates a graph called the point spread function. Because of this diffraction pattern, there's a limit to the resolution that you can achieve with a normal microscope, where two points are very close to each other, they wouldn't be able to be distinguished from each other. This is known as the diffraction limit. In the past few decades, people have developed super resolution techniques which can overcome this diffraction limit. And one of those methods is structured illumination microscopy. In wide field illumination, if you imagine this red square is uh, the red light that's illuminating these two dots, then uh, what should theoretically be seen is just two points. However, what's actually seen is a blurred spot because it's blurred due to the point spread function. In structured illumination microscopy, the resolution can be increased through the phenomenon of moiré fringes. And these occur when two different patterns are superimposed on each other. So in this situation, one pattern is the unknown fluorescence distribution, and the other one is the illumination light, which in this case is purposely striped. And superimposing these causes moiré fringes, which is another pattern which appears on top. And these contain information that wouldn't normally be detectable by the lens. And this is the extra resolution information. So these fine details, which are normally unobservable, are encoded in the images in the form of these moiré patterns. The images can then be decoded to obtain this higher resolution information. In structured illumination microscopy, the incoming light is structured in the form of stripes. And this striped light is shown on the sample at different phase shifts and also different angles. And then the fluorescence from each point can be better isolated. So combining and decoding the images can obtain the higher resolution. And here you can see the two dots can be separated. The contrast of these illumination stripes is known as the modulation contrast. It's important for the stripes to be consistent and have good contrast to get a sufficient increase in resolution. This can be lowered due to a refractive index mismatch between immersion media or mounting media in the sample or low signal to noise ratio. So it's important to ensure that these are optimised to get the best modulation contrast. The size of this blue circle represents the lateral resolution of a microscope in Fourier space. Normally, all of the higher resolution sample information outside of the circle is lost in imaging. But in SIM, information from outside the circle can actually be shifted into the circle in the form of the moiré fringes, as we just saw. But this is mixed together with the normal information, so it needs to be separated. To obtain all of this information, we need to take a series of images with the pattern at different phases and different angles. And this results in seven sets of components, as you can see in the image. These will then be computationally separated and recombined at their proper positions. And since the new reconstruction contains information from twice as far out, it's able to double the resolution. After reconstruction, the data is inverse Fourier transformed to produce the super resolution image. The reconstruction algorithm is in Fourier space and it uses something called the optical transfer function, the OTF. 
that OTF is the Fourier transform of the point spread function, which was shown earlier. To get the best reconstruction, the OTF of the measured sample must be the same as that used in the algorithm, otherwise there'll be reconstruction artefacts. And for this reason, the point spread function is measured experimentally using fluorescent beads first, and this is then used to create OTFs which are used in the reconstruction. Up until 2008, SIM was only able to double the resolution in 2D. In 3D, it hadn't been done because of a problem called the missing cone of information. This top image shows the 3D version of the 2D Fourier space shown in the last diagram, and you can see the dip in the middle where the axial resolution cannot be increased because of out of focus light being detected from other layers in the sample. In 2008, Gustafsson et al. pioneered a way to also increase the axial resolution and experimentally built the first ever 3D SIM microscope. In 2D SIM, the sample was illuminated by two beams of interfering light. In 3D SIM, three beams of light are used to produce a 3D excitation pattern, and this contains more Fourier components, so more image information can be obtained, which can fill in the missing cone and double the Z resolution. In order to image cells in their true structural context, rapid cryofreezing is the gold standard. However, cryofluorescence microscopes are only recently becoming developed for super-resolution techniques. At the B24 beamline, a cryosim microscope has been built in collaboration with the Micron Advanced Bioimaging Unit at the University of Oxford. This can be useful for correlative studies with other cryomicroscopies such as cryoelectron tomography or cryosoft x-ray tomography. The advantages of SIM over other super-resolution techniques are that thicker samples can be imaged uh, over 10 micrometers in thickness, Less intense illumination is needed compared to other super-resolution techniques which need to take over a thousand images, and there's also no need to use special blinking fluorophores. The disadvantages are that it has lower resolution than other super-resolution techniques. Currently this is approximately 100 nanometers. Also SIM is a highly complex technique and there can be many artifacts occurring in the images. Artifacts can be misinterpreted as, as information, but Micron Oxford have developed some software which can help to check for these, which I'll go over later in the presentation. This is the layout of the cryosim microscope from above. The lasers are combined into one path using mirrors and dichroics, and then pass through a neutral density filter to attenuate their intensity, and through a periscope to shift the beam height up. They then go through a square aperture to limit the light to the active area of the spatial light modulator. The SLM diffracts the beam to create the structured light patterns. The light reflected from the SLM passes through an iris to remove high diffraction orders and the polarisation is rotated. Then the light is focused by some more lenses and reflected onto a dichroic mirror and eventually into the objective lens. From here it shines on the sample which is inside a cryo stage. The emitted fluorescence light is reflected through the dichroic mirror and split in two and is then detected by two different cameras. It's important to recognise artefacts in SIM images which may result from the reconstruction process. These could be misinterpreted as biologically relevant features and lead to false conclusions. These are some examples of artefacts found in SIM. Hammer stroke artefacts are due to noise mixing with poorly resolved structural features in the image. Lensing is a blurry lens shape seen in the axial direction and happens in curved samples with different refractive properties. A hatch pattern can happen due to wrong angle settings in the reconstruction. Ghosting is a double vision effect due to a refractive index mismatch. Honeycomb artefacts are hexagonal repeating patterns due to out-of-focus signal. And Z-wrapping happens when end-of-stack images get transferred to the other side of the stack, as seen in this image, where the feature in the first slice is also seen in the last slice, but it's not actually real. 
SimCheck is a free plugin for ImageJ which can help to spot reasons for errors in the image to see if something is actually an artifact and to check that you're using the correct parameters. So it can tell you if there's errors in the calibration or in the way that you did the imaging or in the sample preparation or reconstruction. There are four checks you can do on the raw data and four checks you can do on the reconstructed data. So on the raw data you can do a channel intensity profile. This is a plot of the average intensity in each Z plane and it shows if there's any photo bleaching or if the intensity changes between the different illumination patterns and angles. There's also a raw Fourier projection of the whole Z stack of raw images. There should be first and second order spots visible, which represent the high frequency information. There's a motion and illumination variation check. This does an overlay of the five phase shifted images on top of each other to see if there's any uneven illumination or if the sample moved during imaging, as this can cause reconstruction artifacts. There's a raw modulation contrast check. This is the contrast of the stripes. It's important to have good contrast for good reconstruction. And this can also recommend a value for the Wiener filter, which is applied during the reconstruction. The reconstructed data can also be analysed to understand where a problem came from, such as if it was a calibration error or wrong acquisition settings or wrong reconstruction parameters. The reconstructed intensity histogram check calculates a minimum to maximum ratio of the intensities in the image and this can tell you if you have low signal to noise ratio or low modulation contrast. The modulation contrast map plots the modulation contrast to noise at each point in the raw image and this can be compared to the reconstructed image and if there are any features in the reconstructed image at places where there's low modulation to noise then it's likely that, that these features are actually artifacts. There's also reconstructed Fourier projections available and these images can also be viewed as Fourier transforms and this can be used to estimate the resolution of the reconstruction and to find atypical patterns which may be errors. Finally there's the spherical aberration mismatch check. This calculates the Z minimum variation by plotting the minimum value in each Z slice compared to the mean value. If there's a lot of variation it could be because the sample optical transfer function used for reconstruction is not similar to the real conditions. It could also be because of spherical aberration caused by differences in the refractive indices or changes in temperature or because the stripe pattern changes focus, in which case the system may need to be recalibrated. There's also tools which can help with calibrating the system. Since SIM is a complex technique, Micron Oxford have released a set of guidelines to ensure that SIM data is accurately presented in publications. The full details are in this paper, but here are some key points. It's important to include the raw and reconstructed data, the full 16-bit or 32-bit images in the database. Also, it's important to include the calibration OTF files for repeatability. Don't discard negative values in the reconstruction process. Some commercial software may do this automatically. If more than one fluorescence channel is used, explain how the channels were aligned. Check that what you think is a biological structure isn't just a reconstruction artefact. If it's a repeating pattern or of structured shapes, it's probably an artefact. Add any other filter settings, such as the Wiener filter, which is used to filter noise, and explain how the OTF was obtained and how it matched the sample PSF. You can also experimentally measure the resolution, such as by measuring the full width half maximum of diffraction limited beads, and use this rather than the theoretical resolution. And it's also important to add the system configuration details and the acquisition parameters. Recently, researchers at the B24 Beamline have developed a user-friendly workflow for correlative imaging using cryosim and cryo x-ray tomography. Correlative imaging can give new insights into what happens inside cells by combining morphological, structural and chemical information. 
In this image, you can see that the specific vesicles which were involved in transporting Rio virus inside a cell have been identified. Cryosim showed which endosomes were carrying the virus. They also found that they can reach the perinuclear area by three hours and were able to identify a clear timeline for the virus escape. This type of imaging could not have easily been done by other microscopy methods without sectioning or sample processing which could cause artefacts. The combination of cryosim and cryosoft x-ray tomography can reveal complex cellular processes in 3D at nanometer resolution in a near-native state, so it can be useful for many biological studies. The resolution of cryosim can be improved further, and research is currently being done on this. One problem is that there are many aberrations caused by the temperature gradient, because the sample is cryocooled, but the objective is at room temperature. One solution is to use adaptive optics, which is a technology that can manipulate the optical wavefront. An adaptable deformable mirror can be added, which can remove the aberrations by deforming to improve a distorted input wavefront. And this is something Micron Oxford are currently working on for the cryosimant diamond. At the moment, the cryosim uses an air objective, Cryo-immersion objectives could improve the resolution, but they're still being developed. If they do become available, they could significantly increase the resolution because they have a higher numerical aperture, so they could collect more of the emitted light. Nonlinear SIM is also another technique being developed. Theoretically, this can give unlimited resolution, but in reality it's limited due to signal-to-noise ratio and a limited amount of light. Experimental research has been done by introducing a non-linearity, such as by using photo-switchable dyes, and research is being done on how to implement this in 3D. In summary, structured illumination microscopy is a super-resolution technique that can emit down to 100 nanometers in resolution, and has recently been adapted to be used with cryopreserved samples. Cryosim is a powerful imaging tool due to its compatibility with widely used fluorescent labels, rapid multi-channel acquisition and efficient optical sectioning capability. The user-friendly Cryosim developed at the B24 beamline at Diamond Light Source means it has the potential for many correlative studies to deliver further breakthroughs in biological research. Thank you for watching.